think um, the, the questions actually at this point uh, are really um, open. Um, we encourage you to have uh, comments about the manifesto. Um, thank you, Hollis, for the wonderful reading. Thank you very much. Um, but we encourage, encourage questions, comments about the manifesto, and also any of the, uh, you know, that, that those questions can be addressed to anyone or all of us, as well um, uh, if you have any question followed up from any of the talks we heard earlier. We got a couple. One microphone. Hi, thank you everyone for these wonderful talks. Um, so I have a question which some of you will be able to address probably quite differently depending on your background, but I've been thinking a lot about ethics um, in my own work and how art sculptures are, or at least the art world today, whether it be academic or you know, the everyday practice, um, is in a sort of financial crisis given the sort of cultures that we live in, depending on where we are, right? So I'm thinking about, um, you, you know, uh, Netherlands or other places um, have money for the arts, whereas in a Canadian context, there's less money for um, the arts and academia. So I guess my question is, um, what are your thoughts about the animal as an art commodity, um, specifically how we sell art and the ethical tension of selling the animal body um, and how maybe you've had experiences with artists and how they feel about selling animal bodies, but then at the same time being an artist in a world that sometimes doesn't really appreciate um, art and doesn't fund it in the way that they maybe would fund more STEM research or how would have you. So, <laughs> How many animal bodies have you sold, Mark? <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I think I think one of the things that's interesting, of course, is that that taxidermy animals, animal bodies, exist without calling themselves art, and they and they have they have quite a robust market for people who use them for a wide variety of things, and and of course, I, but I would say most taxidermy that I know of are, are really things that hunters. Uh, want to use as as a memory of their kill, right? And so that that certainly seems to be the dominant um, commercial market for taxidermy. But of course, there is a secondary market for taxidermy, which are um, things that are essentially decoration or souvenir. So I, th I think that that's very different. Whether you I, most taxidermists I know don't think about themselves as artists, and I'm not really interested in those kind of questions, whether someone is an artist or not. For me, producing culture is producing culture, so I, I, I don't think, I'm not interested in the hierarchy or whether someone makes those definitions. But I, I you know, that, that clearly is something that exists as, as, a, as a market and as a commodity and, and has very, a di very different approach than, say, work here in the museum, which, which clearly speaks of itself as artfulness. I'm not sure how many animals I've sold. Um, I'd like to follow up also that, you know, when we, we uh, just to break down a, as a commodity again, you know, the, the challenge with animal um, as, a, as a material is, uh, is preservation, right? And so if we can guarantee an ink is archival up to 100 years or a silver gelatin print is archival up to 100 years, as a financial commodity, I have a, a way of understanding what I'm investing in. Um, and from what I understand, um, obviously there are pieces that people spend a lot of money on, a, a Damien Hirst, uh, which wouldn't be taxidermy, right, because it's a wet, wet preserved piece. It's not actually taxidermy. And, um, but it's still, that piece would, uh, you know, there's, there's a reason for investing in it. But I think going out and looking for a lot of, of uh, you know, new artists who are working with uh, material that you can't guarantee how long it's going to last that that may suppress the price ac across the board not like it's not you know it's not like a gold rush on that as material mm -hmm. uh, you, you know, I mean just out of interest we um, sold a piece of work which involved it must have been 30 taxidermic specimens fairly recently, 
uh, but we sold the idea, not the, not the specimens. The specimens don't belong to us, they don't belong to anyone. So each time the work is reconstituted, reconfigured, re, re shown, uh, it actually sits in conjunction with a, one specific collage work we did. And so every time that, that is shown, again, the, the specific specimens have to be found, not specific specimens, but specific examples of particular species have to be re sort of gathered together and, and put. So I think the idea of selling an idea rather than physical bodies is quite fun, really. It's enjoyable to be able to do that. Hi, um, I can appreciate the ethical difference between, you know, working with an endangered species versus a pest or a goat. But I guess I'm also was hoping someone would touch on either personal or experience in the field when it comes to you can't actually get consent from these animals. Um, and then without sounding too, I don't know, out there, if there's anyone who has any thoughts on like the impact on maybe that animal's spirit or kind of. Any ideas on thoughts on that? I feel like I'm leaning in already. Yeah, you are. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. There are. I mean, that's you're not at all alone on that question, and I think that that is something that we touch in on in the manifesto a little bit with the um, and, and it's you know there's reasons why I, I for the longest time I didn't touch any animal product. Uh, I mean, I sorry, I touched animal products, but I didn't use it in artwork. Um, but I have a leather belt and I'm wearing leather shoes. Um, and there was a while where I did not, I was vegan and I, for health reason, whatever, it doesn't matter. I, I'm no longer, although if you say you do vegan taxidermy, guarantee you're getting vegan food. Just that's a warning for anybody out there. <laughs> um, long time, it's fine, but that's just, I, I'm consistently saying, no, I do vegan taxidermy. Um, but in the case, I still don't believe that the materials I'm using um, don't have an impact on the environment, um, even, even because they're made of plastic. You know, I still see them as ha having an effect. Now, in terms of spirit, um, you know, there are, I do know people who uh, will buy taxidermy pieces and then bury them, um, give them sort of burial. Um, and I know uh, there's an artist in uh, Vancouver who was deathly afraid of um, mongooses, and she's been, um, uh, collecting, not mongoose, yeah, I guess it's mongoose out there, um, but been collecting them um, and, and giving them, um, uh, and they're always poorly done, the ones that, that you find on uh, eBay and stuff, and she then takes them and makes a, a house for them and makes a, a, a new life for them, and for her, that's, that's a therapeutic experience. Now, does that speak to the actual animal itself? It, uh, of course not. Um, but I, I do think that, you know, we, we've done a lot of um, master classes and Scott Bibas, who I showed the, 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 the dark piece, the, the zombie piece. Um, Scott uh, is one of the most beautiful presenters. Um, he's just got this calm about him and he, he looks like a total hillbilly uncle that you, you know, so when it comes from him, people go, Ooh. But he says, he says one of the things about that experience is it's the most intimate experience you're going to have with that, anything, that animal skinning it. And you have to have respect for that moment. And, and again, that doesn't say anything about the, the spirit of the animal. It's still this violent kind of experience which doctors and nurses and chefs and all go through. Um, but in this case, what he was saying, which I thought was really interesting, is you really at that moment is very intimate. And that is something you have to respect. A little bit to what you're saying, you know. But you're not alone. You're definitely, people do express that. Yeah. I have a question for the panel about what you all think is driving this question of ethics right now. And I have this question mainly because I've heard several different answers, I think, through different presentations. So Steve, you started, I think, by suggesting that a critical mass of artists is assembling now or forming around this, these questions or driving these questions forward. Carrie, in your agnostic position, I think you were suggesting that there's a difference between a technologically driven project um, as opposed to something like Mark was talking about with the condors, that that's um, with uh, using, say, traditional conservation methods. It's definitely a different ethical territory um, that 
requires a different response. And lastly, Robert, you suggested, I think quite interestingly, that it's a critical mass of young female taxidermists, at least from your perspective, who are driving these questions forward. And I think that's really interesting in part because of the parallel situation with um, the, veterinary the veterinary profession having changed drastically since the 80s once the gender balance tipped in favor of women. Mm -hmm. And death sciences are almost uh, are, are tilting towards uh, a lot more women entering the death sciences and morticians. Yeah. I, I, to start off with a kind of um, slightly indirect response to your question, Susan, um, I think that for me, the single most important statement in this new manifesto is at the start of point three, a death is a terrible thing to waste. Partly because the manifesto itself is explicitly addressed to artists rather than to a wider public. Um, and much as in several of the points in, in Mark's original manifesto, um, that comment, a death is a terrible thing to waste, feels as though it's addressed to artists because it's not saying, as, as some of the other points come close to, the, to doing, don't do certain things. It's saying, if you're going to deal with this subject matter, take responsibility for what you're doing and doing it, do it seriously in whatever that means for you, uh, but to take on responsibility for it. But it still allows the range of choices that artists want to make in order to make the work that is vital to, to them. So, yeah, I mean, it doesn't address the aspect of your question that's saying what's changing, but I think as one of the things that it's important to kind of keep present across these manifestos is that idea of artists taking responsibility for what they're doing, and if they're doing something that is likely to cause offence, Personally, I don't think that's a reason for not doing something. No, I don't think so. But also, we were thinking very much to make something that was practical because we, there are a lot of very young people who are doing this who yeah. really do not have a kind of sense of the scope that they could get themselves in, in very serious trouble. Yeah. I mean, yeah. in terms of health issues as well as in terms of legal things. Yeah. And, so, and so, you know, we, we specifically tried to keep this quite practical as a, as a manifesto and, and um, as opposed to more theoretical. Yeah. And I'd like to add that um, I, the taxidermists that I have spoken with and, and I have studied their ethical statements and they do mostly make an effort to, to write those disclaimers on their websites and in their self-promotional material um, in part as a kind of defense against um, misunderstanding, but also I think they're participating in a dialogue and their work is, is provocative of that dialogue. And I think that in some cases that's their mission. I think that's what they want to do. Um, and then there's also this kind of recuperative element where um, the, uh, the, the vegan taxidermist who is working with um, roadkill and refuses to, to use any animals that have been hunted or deliberately killed, there's a, a kind of um, returning respect to the animal or something like that that they bring forward in their work. Yeah. It's like the world's largest microphone. <laughs> um, I mean, one, just to bring something else to the table. I mean, we haven't talked about at all today uh, the context of biopolitics and biopolitical thought, um, which I think is, has really changed uh, a lot of the conversations, not in the sense of the manifesto that you guys did, which I think is, is quite focused and is, is focused on a particular kind of practice and audience, um, but in the sense of thinking about uh, the fact that the, the environmental or ecological, the genealogies of environmental or ecological ethics and animal rights and biopolitics are actually quite different from each other and, and, and have focused on different problems. And it's a conversation that I think, you know, maybe hasn't fully gelled and trickled down, not just in academia, but for practicing artists as well. 
in the sense of thinking about, well, if, if you want to be responsible and make an art, what are you responsible to? And, and, and who are you responsible for? So one of the insights about biopolitical, from biopolitical thought I think is valuable is that it, it does not take for granted the fact that the human-animal distinction is a fundamental or constitutive distinction in terms of the question of violence. So um, one thing that I talk about in Before the Law is, you know, there are millions and millions and millions of companion animals in the United States that have access to levels of health care and quality of food and, and, and you know, all, and, and health insurance, in fact, and so on and so forth, that millions and millions and millions of, of the planet's human population don't have access to. I mean, they don't have access to clean water, much less health insurance. So whatever's, I mean, my point is that whatever's going on in these situations, there's a kind of violence that's not just a direct killing, but is also, as Derrida puts it, a, a, a massive letting die. That everyday life in our, as Richard Rorty puts it, rich white northern bourgeois democracies, unabashedly, is predicated upon. And, and in that context, the distinction between human and animal is really not a fundamental, um, it's one distinction that's in play, but it's only one distinction that's in play. And of course the marker for this in, in the history of biopolitical thought is the function of race yep. and the racialization and eventually then animalization of, of various populations for the purposes of, you know, being able to make them, you know, as the saying goes, killable but not murderable. So I think my sense of one thing that's changed and shifting the context right now, you know, thinking back, and I really like Steve's I mean, I, I sort of share Steve's sense in his talk that, you know, there has been kind of a shift. And I think part of that shift is a reconjugation of the genealogies of what used to be pretty separate strains of, and you remember the old arguments between people doing environmental ethics and people doing animal rights, and now biopolitical thought. I think that reconjugation, partly under the pressure of climate change, partly under the pressure of the so-called Anthropocene, has really rearranged the sense of what one is responsible to and how to exercise responsibility in ways that I think are very much a work in progress for, for, you know, for scholars and for artists as, as well. So in that context, you can really take care and engage in acts of respect for an individual animal in, in doing art, which is actually a mask and a cover not intentionally, but for, but for other more pervasive, less iconic and identifiable kinds of violence that those very practices are made possible by. So it's a very, I think it's a very complicated situation that's in play that artists address in, in very different ways. But I think for that reason, it's, I think it's very early in that conversation actually. So I'm, you know, and, and situations like this are a way to begin to, 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 to rewire that conversation. And just one more thing on, on the, the gender di divide-ish possibility. Um, you know, it's, it's uh, I would say that in, in general, the artists that I know who use that statement on their websites, um, I, I think a lot of it is, I think um, masking is, is definitely protecting. Um, I think we're in a sophisticated legal world now where we have these feelings that we, we use a lot of, um, pseudo-legal speak uh, to explain ourselves before people can judge us. Um, and I think that, um, and again, I, I've written those words on a piece of paper for an art show. I'm, I'm taking total credit for tr trying to do that in a show, and yet at the same time looking at it now and saying it's, it's, it's not enough. Um, it's, it's a beginning, and it's, it, starts the, it starts us from we're a little protected. Um, Miranda and I are talking, and ultimately it's people like what we've been talking about, what you're doing, who will have a better idea whether um, uh, there's actually is a shift towards um, more women making taxidermy or more women working with animal arts. Uh, as a man, it becomes a little harder for me to investigate that, and that's something that I was trying to, to do, uh, but personally as a participant observer, I sort of hit a wall. Um, but one other thing I would like to put, talk about in terms of this, like, this mask, um, uh, we were talking about this earlier also, I'm not actually sure that people do protest um, taxidermy 
people and events and objects the way that we conceive that they do. Um, I've worked with PETA who've hired us to make animals for events for them because they said, you're using an animal that was killed by a car, we can use that for this thing. And I, th I thought it was a weird conversation, to be honest, but it was, I mean, th they never, I had one group come to protest a show and I had a conversation with them and they said, you know, I really didn't expect you to be thinking about all these things. We're, I'm actually pretty impressed. And I was like, sort of like, whoa, we dodged that one. But I, I, I wanted to put this out, because uh, you mentioned this about the polar bears and you, you had them in the cases, which obviously makes a lot of sense, but I'm not sure I know of any, any, any um, PETA attacks or any times that animals have been destroyed by, in, in shows. I mean, it's preventative, but is that, that just, was that? Yeah, I, I, I don't know, just very briefly, I don't know how serious that was. But in, in relation to that show, but certainly we, the first time we, the first iteration we had after that was in the Oxford University Natural History Museum, um, and they did something weird because they, they because there was a, that whole issue about um, the, the the labs that were experimenting with animals and so on. There was a lot of protests at the time, so that was it was already a very sensitized zone, you know, um, and so there were certain restrictions they put on. Brindis, can you remember what those restrictions were? No, but, but there, there, were, there were problems and they were, they were, they were very nervous about it. Yeah, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You want to say something? yeah um, I think there was one sheep by Damon Hurst that got vandalized. Uh, one of the wet specimens, there was some black ink that was put in. So that's the only case I know, but you're quite right. I think there are very few cases of vandalism yeah. or attack. I think it's cultural with yeah. the idea of the fur coat getting the blood thrown yeah, on yeah. it. Yeah. But I think, I think it's like that, that statement. It's... It's sort of, um, I, I know you're gonna have a hard time with this. I've thought about why you're gonna have a hard time with this, but I'm making art. It's that kind of preemptive, it's very theatrical, I know. I didn't prepare for that, sorry about that. Um, but it's that, that kind of, I think, preventative, like let's get ourselves all on the same level, maybe. Well, there's a difference between an attack on an object and threats to artists. And I'm sitting next to Angela saying, sure. and I know we talked about this before, that Self-protection is not just a legal question. People, as your manifesto says, get really angry. Well, well they get angry. They get angry on, if I, if I may, and Angela, you correct me if I'm wrong. They get angry through social media and on the internet, where they're protected and they, we are insane, as a, as a, as a, as a people. Anyone that gets on the internet, to some degree, gives away a bit of their sanity. Um, and I have my phone right here. Um, but, but because of that, people write awful things all the time. Um, and we've got candidates who are running for president who <laughs> say awful things all the time. So we've got this culture of, of disrespect that, that's actually, you know, or, or a culture of, of um, presumed respect for myself but not for you. You've got to earn it. Um, what I will say uh, that I found with the, the tax mayors that get threats, the women get, get more sexualized threats than the men do, and in general, the men tend to get threats that are, are like, you know, they, they cuss at them, but, but the women get very, usually get, I'm gonna do what you did to that animal. And, it, and that, I think, is a presumption that the writer, be it male or female, because it's sometimes, it's not exclusively one, that person, I believe, is, is uh, making an assumption that a woman should know better, she's got a nurturing sense, and this is anti-nurturing. And I think, you know, there's a lot more going on than, than just that, that statement, but makes sense. Angela, would you like to share your experience? Or are you open to doing that? Can I put you on the spot? <laughs> um, well, I have found that, um, that with my own art in exhibitions that um, there have been protests by animal rights groups. Um, and I'd say that perhaps that happens more at a local level and that you're not hearing about it, you know, it's not making national news and it's not making international news unless it was, you know, particularly high profile. Um, I'd have to say that that was happening uh, more though, probably 15, 20 years ago and not so much recently. Now, whether that's because there's an understanding of where my work is coming from, um, as opposed to there's less protests, I don't know. Um, I, 
I do get um, threats on social media, but that's generally from people who just don't understand. They see something made of wax and think it's made of blood and, you know, you just killed an animal and, and popped it on the internet. Um, so, um, you know, I'm not sure what you do about ignorant people. That's, <laughs> that's what it comes down to. <laughs> I, yeah, I, mean, I just want to say that you know the flip side of this, of course, is that um, amateur taxidermy and uh, and events like the ones that Rob has are amazingly popular. Like we, mm -hmm. the, our friends at the Morbid Anatomy Museum, host uh, these uh, lessons in, in taxidermy where people can try their skills at learning how to taxidermy a white rat, and they are sold out all the time. So I, I think that there is also this other end of that phenomenon, which are people just uh, mm. dying to engage in this process, and, and that's a very real thing. Yeah. Well, I completely agree that taxidermy is the new knitting or something like that, you know, <laughs> so it seems, you know, this kind of hipsterish thing, but I'm just trying to put, I mean, I completely understand that you need to talk about um, taxidermy in that sense, it's kind of very emotionally loaded uh, and ethically loaded, but I, I just try to put it into a broader frame, I think, of art practices. And I think as soon as something is politically engaged, I'm thinking of overturning, overthrowing of monuments, uh, let's say after the, uh, after the end of the Cold War, or vandalism of all kinds, uh, Bildersturme and stuff like that. I mean, that has always been happening, and I think you will, I mean, uh, I think as soon as you address something that's political, you will get these strong reactions. And I just want to point that out, I think, at this moment, that this is not just a specific problem with these type of works. Mm -hmm. And I think, um, yeah, one has to be aware of that, of course, but that's what happens if you put yourself out there, I think. We're also in, a, in an age where, without context. And so why comment about the, the last piece that is get, gets put around the internet and people go, oh, it's so beautiful, and I'll see, I'll see a blog post that's a week old and someone will say, I love their work, I love their work. And maybe there's 100 people commenting and maybe someone will say, you know, he went to jail for that piece. Um, but, but it'll get refreshed again. And that, that, um, <coughs> that repetition of, of imagery is possibly another thing that's causing more of the, um, you know, I think I lost my track. <laughs> I, um, I, I really just wanted to kind of add that I think that a lot of the points in the, in the manifesto, and particularly that one that I was talking about, about a death is a terrible thing to waste, apply just as importantly to other forms of representing animals' deaths, including photographic treatments of taxidermy, of roadkill, and so on, and that I think that the majority of artists who I know of who are doing those kind of photographic representations are thinking seriously about what they're doing and aren't just thinking, oh, an opportunity for a nice gory image or, or whatever. Um, so I, I know that's not the main focus of this manifesto, but I, I, I think the questions about ethics do extend to people who um, are having no physical contact with the animals themselves. And that, you know, that in itself doesn't exclude you from ethical responsibility um, for, or ethical engagement with, with what you're doing. Thank you. Um, um, just to put maybe a, things a little bit in, in perspective, I have another slogan we could say, uh, if it comes to our animal food production, which is a horrible life and a horrible death is a wonderful thing to consume. We're not addressing that. I mean, all of those of us who eat meat, that is the reality of food production. Any comment to that? Yeah, I'll address that. I mean, I mean, my last book, Before the Law, is all about this, actually. It's about um, not stopping at the water's edge and species difference when it comes to um, thinking about uh, a, a scale of violence toward animals that makes, it puts everything else in, into just, I mean, way, way in the shade. I mean, you're talking about nine billion, with a B, animals per year. 
in North America killed for um, in industrial food production. And that's, the number's probably higher, actually. So, um, and it is related, I mean, it might sound perverse in a way to talk about qualities of violence, but I think it's related to Steve's comment and some of the other comments we've had. Um, it is, it is a form of, of violence that subtends our so-called normal or everyday life that, um, that's continuous with other kinds of violence and, and if you think we live in a biopolitical moment, um, for which the human-animal distinction is actually not a fundamental, fundamental distinction. And so you have to ask the extent to which terms like you know, genocide um, or Holocaust, which have been used by a lot of philosophers to talk about what happens in industrialized animal food production, are and are not, you know, appropriate terms, uh, and and have to be parsed, you know, very carefully, realizing that different people have very different investments um, and resonances in in the use of of those terms. But I think I think you're absolutely right. I mean, the the whole the whole um, you know the whole the whole question of of meat. <laughs> and the making invisible of this kind of violence um, in the production of a, of a kind of a meat-based culture is, is so much bigger than any other form of violence toward animals and actually toward the environment that it kind of goes back to what I was talking about earlier that it, it leads back to questions of responsibility, but they're not questions of responsibility that can be addressed by taking this or that stance on a particular engagement with a, with, a, with a particular body, even though one has to confront that responsibility in, in every interaction with an animal. So, I mean, one way to put it for me is I would never kill or harm another living creature, you know, to make a piece of art, but I simultaneously realize I'm in a, posi a very privileged to pos position to be able to make that statement, right? because of the society I live in, because of my class position, my race, you know, and a whole list of stuff that I could, I could give you. So, so the question of violence and responsibility in that context, I think, becomes a really, really complicated one, and, and, and not one that's immediately accessible. Um, try as one might to fix it and make it better, and this is what's so irritating about a lot of animal rights people and, you know, vegans, and I mean, I say this as a formal animal rights activist, is the presumption that you can make yourself clean, you know, by, by, by taking this or that action with regard to animals. Having said that, I, I've been a vegetarian for 30 years, and I can give you a long list of reasons why I think it's better not to eat meat, that doesn't, but that doesn't exculpate me from being enmeshed in these other forms of violence that everything I do in my daily life is, is a part of. So for me, the, you know, the ethical questions are not easily made iconographic, <laughs> you know, and addressable in these sort of intentional <coughs> ways. And so to me, the ethic, ethics becomes a process of confronting the responsibility of trying to do the impossible. But that doesn't exculpate you from having to do it and having to make those decisions, you know. So I think this is a back to Susan's question about, about biopolitics as well. I think this is a hugely, a hugely important question. And I, I would like to add that I, I see this as a visuality issue because um, I've noticed in the last couple of weeks there's a meme going around the internet. It's a laundry list of things that a person is willing to look at and then the one thing that they don't want to see is cruelty to animals. And so, you know, I can see where uh, people don't want to, to think about this. My students are always my gauge. I talk about animal issues in my classes all the time. And um, they uh, are, are uh, shocked that, you know, um, this kind of thing happens and they don't want to, to know about it. And so we talk about ag gag bills and uh, whether that's a kind of censorship and what sort of violence are you willing to, to tolerate? You want to, to watch people killing each other in all kinds of uh, fantastical ways, but we don't want to know where our sandwich comes from or how that sandwich came into being. So um, it's all about, I think that, um, again, the taxidermy artists are, are initiating a, a really important conversation in asking people to think about where um, 
you know, that connecting those dots to, to the violence. Uh, we can tolerate looking at roadkill now, okay? So can we now tolerate looking at, you know, uh, industrial agriculture? But I think it's also important to, to kind of specify what kind of animals we are talking about. I mean, I know we're talking about taxidermy here, but if it comes to insects, I'm sure all of us have at some point, vegan or not, killed some insects, and Mark here is a mass murderer, I think. <laughs> so maybe, because you did the, yeah, <laughs> just to point that out, because you did this piece, the, the great Munich buck hunt, for instance, where you killed lots and lots of insects. And I think a lot of us would have no problem with that, to do that on a daily basis. Well, I mean, for that matter, I'd like to point out that, you know, for every pharmaceutical uh, that's manufactured, you're, you're basically riding on the backs of thousands and thousands yeah. of laboratory yeah. rats. So. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, just, I just want to add to this that, I mean, I think one of the things that, one of the things that I love about and have always loved about um, Mark's work and, you know, is that it, it does not allow you to think of non-human life as this generic <laughs> pile of stuff, you know, so paying attention to the specific details of particular types of ways of being in the world for which the term the animal is, is such a blunt instrument, you just have to get, first thing you have to do is just get rid of that term and say, well, what kinds of creatures are we talking about and what are the, what are the ways that they exist in the world? And that's embedded in these thick contexts of the difference between uh, domesticated animals versus wild animals and all, the, and all the iconography and the psychological investments we have in that. I'm simply coming back to your question of trying to point out the danger that I think is, is salient in a lot of biopolitical thought about this, which is you can't use a zoological or racial taxonomic designation to make a certain class of beings killable but not murderable. And, and that's, that's where one, I think, has to start to think about questions of responsibility, knowing, knowing that the history of science shows us that those lines have shifted dramatically. I mean, think about what we know now about creatures we you know, are taking seriously as members of our moral community that 150 years ago, you know, we wouldn't have any moral qualms about, you know, killing and making specimens out of. So paying attention to the history of science shows us that that line is constantly, is constantly moving and should remind us that the lines we're drawing now will move in the future. And so the, the, the details, I mean, the kind of work that, you know, Mark has done and Mark and Brenda's have done and other artists that we've talked about today do, I think focus on the fact that those details matter and that life is not an animal life, quote unquote, is, not a, is never a generic something that we can, that we can take for granted. I um, just wanted to follow up the biopower um, thread, which I think is really interesting also because there's this paradox that continues with the discussion of taxidermy and animals in contemporary art more in general, which I wrote about last year. And it's going to be central to my next book, and it's about the invisible animals, the ones that are used as um, elements in works of art but become invisible through rendering. So I'm thinking about Nicole Shuking's um, paradigm here, and you know, rabbit glue in classical painting more than brushes, with through which the classical painting, for instance, uh, materializes all the invisible animals that died in the making of these works of art, as well as contemporary works of art. And I think. All the ethical questioning that hovers around taxidermy, to me, ends up falling flat as soon as the consideration of the invisible animal that um, comes to surface. I think if we want to really map an ethicality for taxidermy in contemporary art, then we can't forget about the invisible animals. The very moment we do that, we're just being very partial and making an exceptional case for taxidermy, which I don't think um, can be sustained because technically taxidermy plays a very specific representational role based on visibility, as Stephanie was saying. There is this response um, that it's difficult to manage and mediate because of representation, representation, but once the animal is grounded and dispersed, it's still there. Yet again, it's not there visibly and the responses are very different. So.
I think maybe we're done. So um, thank you all very much. This has been just incredible. Um, I can't thank you enough for coming and sharing your wisdom with us. And I could do this for another day. <laughs> maybe in a week or two. <laughs>